Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good day all of you. This is Dr. Gaurav Agnihotri and today I'm going to give a talk on the ischiorectal fossa. The ischiorectal fossa is actually a misnomer. It's a very difficult thing to start a class like this but actually this terminology has been used for years and years but now what the latest uh, the anatomists are feeling is that this term is actually a misnomer. So it is the ischiorectal fossa better be called as ischioanal fossa. So it's a wedge shaped fossa present on each side. If I put my hands like this, one hand is representing the fossa of right side and one hand is representing the fossa of left side. So it's a fat filled space essentially. There are other structures also in it. We'll come to, uh, we'll describe it in detail. So it's a fat filled space on either side of the anus. So it better be called ischio anal fossa. So the gap which, which you are seeing in my between my fingers of the two hands that represents the anus. So this fat filled space or the ischioanal fossa instead of ischiorectal fossa if we can call it, it is uh, very important because it allows the distension of the anus. So it has got a functionality associated with it. Whenever the anus is distended, this contracts because it contains fat on either side and because of the contraction it allows distension of the anus. Again a very important structure in the body is the pelvic diaphragm. So the pelvic diaphragm is lying on top of the ischioanal fossa on each side. So the ischioanal fossa has got fat it supports the pelvic diaphragm above and you know pelvic diaphragm is one of the diaphragms in the body which is very important for the providing support to the organs, the pelvic organs. So ischiorectal fossa has got a functionality associated with it. These, it represents the two wedge shaped spaces which better be called ischioanal fossa lying on either side of the anus and this fossa filled with fat contracts when there is distension of the anus and this fossa is also supporting the overlying diaphragm that is formed by levator ani that is the pelvic diaphragm. And this fossa in its lateral wall somewhere around here contains a canal that canal is called pudendal canal. So in the center is the anus and on either side is the ischioanal fossa and the lateral wall contains a canal known as the pudendal canal. Now this pudendal canal carries the neurovascular supply of the perineum. So the fat in the fossa, it protects the pudendal canal. So pudendal canal is also one of the components of ischiorectal fossa or ischioanal fossa and the presence of pudendal canal gives it vital importance because pudendal canal is the neurovascular supply of the perineum. So, Pudendal canal is also a content of ischioanal fossa and the main content of ischioanal fossa is fat. There are actually six constituents of the ischioanal fossa but initially I just want to concentrate on the functionality of the ischioanal fossa. So I will repeat my three findings. Ischioanal fossa has got three types of functions. It supports the overlying pelvic diaphragm formed by the levator ani. It allows the distension of the anus and it provides a cushion to the pudendal canal lying in relation to its lateral wall. So these things the students must understand before we go into the morphological characteristics of this wedge shaped space on either side of the anal canal. So this ischioanal fossa has got clinical implications and those clinical implications are depicted on the monitor in the slide. So one of them is abscess. 
So there may be an abscess formation in the istioanal fossa. So if an abscess is formed in the istioanal fossa, I told you this has got fat in it. So if an abscess is formed in it, the fat is loosely arranged. So abscess contains fluid. So that fluid has got space to expand because the fat is compressible. So the swellings in this region, the abscesses in this region of the istioanal fossa, they are not that painful. Then another applied aspect of this fossa is the fistula, the fistula in ano or the fistula in rectum or the anorectal fistula. Sometimes what happens is that this abscess which is formed, it opens inside the anus. So on either side of the anal canal, you have got two wedge shaped spaces and if an abscess is formed here, it may drain into the anus in relation to the anal crypts. That is what is called as the fistula in ano. So this fistula may be formed inside or it may also be formed outside in relation to the perineum. This is shown in the slide. The two, uh, one uh, line is going inwards into the pink portion, which is the anal canal and the other line is going outwards towards the perineum. So a fistula formation may take place in relation to the istioanal fossa. Then if the fistula which is formed, which is coming towards the outside, if it does not heal, it may lead to formation of sinus. Another fact is that the fact, fact is that the fat, fat in the istioanal fossa, it may get lesser in amount, particularly in children if they have diarrhea for a long duration of time. So if this fat is not there, it has been observed that this leads to prolapse of rectum in the children. So another function which can be attributed to the istioanal fossa is that it provides stability to the rectum, it provides support to the rectum, it allows for distension of the anal canal at the same time the fat in it provides the cushioning effect, it acts like a cushion for the rectum without which the rectum tends to protrude out through the anus what is referred to as prolapse of the rectum. So this istioanal fossa Mind you, do not think it is a structure which has got lesser importance because once you go through it in the textbooks, one doesn't realize the clinical aspects and the manifestations associated with the istioanal fossa. Now another thing is that at its apex, sometimes the boundaries are not properly attached. This fossa has got a base below and an apex above. So sometimes its boundaries are not properly attached and a deficiency is left there. That is called as the hiatus of Shoal Bay. We will be discussing it subsequently. Through that the pelvic organs can herniate into this istioanal fossa. So istioanal hernia is also a terminology which I would like to introduce to you. So all these are the clinical manifestations of the istioanal fossa and keeping these manifestations in the background. I will start my lecture today, I will start my talk today and I just made this broad outline to you to keep you interested because this topic in the perineal region uh, is avoided mostly by students because it comes in the end of the uh, last part of the book and because the pelvic fascia, the attachments of the pelvic fascia and the uh, perineal membrane and all, the students find it difficult to comprehend initially. But once if you realize the clinical implications of this area, uh, I am sure the students would like to go into detail regarding the morphology and the anatomy of the istioanal fossa. So stay with me as I continue now with the slides describing the istioanal fossa. So istioanal or istiorectal fossa as is classically mentioned in the textbook, it is a wedge shaped space. If you see the figure here in front of you in the slides, marking one which I have made, that is the istioanal or istiorectal fossa. So this green colored uh, uh, area marked by one in the figure is the istioanal fossa. It is a wedge shaped space situated one on each side of the anal canal below the pelvic diaphragm. If you see C in the figure, C depicts the levator ani. So levator ani is the pelvic diaphragm. So this one which is the istioanal fossa, it is filled with fat, it supports the C that is the levator ani muscle on each side which is forming the pelvic 
diaphragm. Now a unique thing about this ischioanal fossa is that its base is directed downwards while its apex is directed upwards. So the base is directed downwards while the apex is directed upwards. So the base is formed by the skin. We are more concerned with the apex. You can see that pointed portion, that area which is marked by 1, it has got a pointed portion. That pointed portion, the upper margin of that is marked by D. So it is the area where D and F meet. D and F. D represents the inferior fascia of the pelvic diaphragm while F represents the obturator fascia in the figure. The marking E here stands for obturator internus. So there are two important muscles in relation to the ischioanal fossa. One is the levator ani and one is the obturator internus marked by C and E in the figure and where the inferior fascia of pelvic diaphragm that is D meets with the obturator fascia which is marked by F in the figure. So where D and F they meet that point is the apex, apex of the ischiorectal fossa and above D is lying the levator ani muscle. Now the tendinous origin of levator ani muscle if suppose it leaves a gap then that gap is called the hiatus of Schwalbe through which the hernia can take place of pelvic organs in the ischioanal fossa. So we have described the base and the apex of the area marked by one in the figure which is the ischioanal fossa. It is mostly filled with fat though there are other contents also we will go into detail. So this ischioanal fossa has got dimensions and those dimensions have been measured and I will tell you why the measurements are important later on. The length of the ischioanal fossa comes out to be 5 centimeters approximately that is the anterior posterior length. The width or the side to side length comes out to be 2.5 centimeters while the depth of this fossa vertically is from 5 to 6.2 centimeters. So why this morphometry is important we will go into the detail subsequently at this point of time I do not want to uh, touch it. So continuing further with the boundaries of the ischioanal fossa well it has got anterior boundary and posterior boundary also. So in this particular slide we are seeing the parasagite uh, this, uh, this particular slide we are seeing the horizontal section in relation to the ischiorectal fossa horizontal section in relation to the ischiorectal fossa. This is a surface view. So uh, in this surface view we uh, see in this surface view we see uh, the green area that represents the perineal membrane. Okay. So anteriorly uh, the ischiorectal fossa is limited by the posterior border of the perineal membrane. Anteriorly the ischiorectal fossa is limited by the posterior border of perineal membrane. So this green structure which you see here that is the perineal membrane. So its posterior border forms the anterior relation of the ischiorectal fossa. If we look at the posterior boundary of the ischiorectal fossa, posteriorly the fossa reaches the lower border of gluteus maximus and sacrotuberous ligament is also forming the posterior boundary of the ischiorectal or ischioanal fossa. Now sacrotuberous ligament in this particular figure is marked by 1. So that represents the sacrotuberous ligament marking 1 represents the sacrotuberous ligaments. So the posterior margin of the green colored portion in the figure and 1 they are representing the anterior and posterior demarcations of the ischioanal fossa. Now coming again, again to the boundaries, now so far we have done the base, we have done the apex and now we are going to do the lateral and medial boundaries. If you look at the figure once again, the lateral boundary, lateral wall is vertical. So it is like a straight line while the medial wall is curved. So these two where they meet that is the apex. So the lateral boundary of the ischiorectal fossa is like this, inferior boundary is like this while the medial boundary is not straight but it is curved. So where the lateral and medial boundaries are meeting that is the apex of the ischioanal 
fossa. Now the lateral wall is vertical and it is formed by two structures. One structure is the obturator internus which is marked by E in the figure. It has got a fascia in association with it while the medial surface of the ischial tuberosity um, a lateral wall is formed by obturator internus and obturator fascia. So if we come to the medial surface which I told you is oblique, the medial surface has got a different orientation. So once again the lateral wall is vertical and is formed by obturator internus and the obturator fascia in the upper part. In the lower part we have got the medial surface of ischial tuberosity. So there are two structures lying in the lateral wall of the ischioanal fossa. Above is the obturator internus and below is the ischial tuberosity. So this is the coronal section in relation to the ischioanal fossa and you are seeing the lateral wall of the ischioanal fossa. Above you find the obturator internus, my fingers they are representing the obturator internus while my palm is representing the ischial tuberosity. So in this figure you see that E represents the obt uh, obturator internus and that portion which is lying uh, below it that is the green colored portion lying below the red colored portion marked by H that is representing the ischial tuberosity. Now we come to the medial wall. I told you the medial wall is oblique. It slopes upwards and laterally and where the lateral and medial walls meet that point is the apex. So the medial wall is formed by which structures? The medial wall is formed by the external anal sphincter. If you see in the figure in the figure which, which is the uh, showing you coronal section of the ischiorectal fossa, you will find that there are three red structures marked by A, B and C, small a, small b and small b. They represent the different parts of the external anal sphincter. So the deepest one is called the deep part, the middle one is called the superficial part while the third part is called the subcutaneous part of external anal sphincter. Coming back again to the medial wall of the ischiorectal fossa. The medial wall of the ischiorectal fossa is sloped. So it is formed by the external anal sphincter and its three constituents. And in the upper part, the medial wall is formed by the levator ani muscle. What you see as the C in the figure, marked by C in the figure. So below you have got the external anal sphincter, above you have got the levator ani. So small a, small b, small c and above you've got the big C. These, these are forming the curved medial wall of the ischiorectal fossa while the lateral wall is formed by E and H that is the obturator internus and the ischial tuberosity. And where C and E are meeting that is the apex of ischiorectal fossa or ischioanal fossa and it has also got a base which lies inferiorly. So if the previous section was the coronal section this is the parasagittal section in relation to the ischiorectal fossa. And what it depicts, what this parasagittal section is essentially depicting is are the recesses in relation to the ischiorectal fossa. Now see ischiorectal fossa we say has got an apex, a base, a medial wall and a lateral wall. But the story does not end here. Some parts of it are extending beyond these limits and that you cannot make out in the coronal section. For, so for that we have got the parasagittal section and this and this and in this particular parasagittal section if you look at 2 that shows the main part of the ischiorectal fossa. Now main part of ischiorectal fossa is the one which you saw in the coronal section but there are some extensions of the ischiorectal fossa or the ischioanal fossa which are marked by 1 and 3 in the figure. They represent the anterior recess and the posterior recess of the ischioanal fossa. Now anterior recess and posterior recess now anterior recess it lies in relation to the pubis. So if I describe it the anterior recess extends forwards above the perineal membrane reaching almost up to the posterior surface of the body of pubis. So you see in the diagram also that in front of uh, one you have got the pubic area. 
This anterior recess is very closely related to the prostate in males or the vagina in females. So what is the anterior recess? It is the recess which is lying anteriorly and it is an extension of the ischio anal fossa which is lying or oriented anteriorly. Then there is a smaller recess which is marked by 3 in the figure. So that 3 in the figure is the posterior recess of the ischio anal fossa. As you can make out in the figure also, it is smaller than the anterior recess and it extends deep to the sacrotuberous ligament. So there are two important recesses, anterior recess and posterior recess. So if you have the ischiorectal fossa on each side and the gap between the two hands of mine is the anal region, then anterior recess is there and posterior recess is there. But then there is also a recess which connects the two ischioanal fossae behind the anal canal. So if I join my thumbs together like this, this now, now my thumbs are representing the horseshoe recess. So what is the importance of this horseshoe recess is that suppose infection takes place in the left ischioanal fossa, then there is actually and the gap between my hands is the anal region then there is actually a possibility of infection to spread from one side to the other through the communication between my thumbs which is representing the horseshoe recess of the ischioanal fossa. So behind the anus, the two ischiorectal fossa or the two ischioanal fossa are connected to each other by a recess that is called the horseshoe recess and this recess provides an anatomical conduit via which infection from one side can spread to the other side. I hope this concept is clear to you because reading the text does not clarify this concept. So this is more a job of the teacher to elaborate on these subjects. Now spaces and canals of the fossa. Now, here what I want to show you is, what I want to talk to you about in this coronal section pertaining to the ischioanal fossa is the facial relations and how uh, one is separated from two in the figure. So one is the ischioanal fossa while two is the perianal space. And what is the difference between the infections of ischioanal space and perianal space? So that is what I want to concentrate on. So perianal space is represented by 2 in the figure. We had previously concentrated on 1 which was the ischioanal space. Now this perianal space has got a perianal fascia. This perianal fascia is represented by L in the figure. So this is separating the ischioanal fossa from the perianal space. L is separating the ischioanal fossa from the perianal space and this L is representing the perianal fascia. So what is it? It is a septum that passes laterally from lower end of longitudinal coat of anal canal. Now where is the longitudinal coat of anal canal? For that I will take your attention to this section of the ischiorectal fossa once again. If you see in relation to the rectum there are two markings A and B. A is the inner coat, B is the outer coat. Inner coat is the circular coat, outer coat is the longitudinal coat. So that longitudinal coat comes down and this perianal fascia passes laterally from the lower end of the longitudinal coat. You can easily make it out in the figure. The circular coat is forming I, I is the internal sphincter. While external sphincter has got three parts lying outside the longitudinal coat and you can see at the lower end of the longitudinal coat extending from medial to lateral side is L which represents the perianal fascia. So this perianal fascia extends medially from white line of Hilton. White line of Hilton is marked by K in the figure to pudendal canal laterally. Pudendal canal is marked by 3 in the figure. So pudendal canal is the neurovascular supply to the perineum. So from white line of Hilton to pudendal canal is L. L is the perianal fascia and we know L is lying the perianal space. So these facial extensions, you know, they are not so complicated 
if they are comprehended in the right manner. So the, this, it separates a shallow subcutaneous, this L separates a shallow subcutaneous perianal space from the deep ischioanal space. Now there is difference, I want you to concentrate here, that there is difference between the between the arrangement of fat in 1 and 2. One is the ischio anal fossa. There the fat is loosely packed. The septa around the fat are incomplete. If suppose this is one locule, if my hand is now representing one locule, locule means an area of fat. Now this locule, the boundary is not complete. Fat is loosely packed and it is large in size. This is the scenario in case of ischioanal fossa. While in perianal fossa, perianal, uh, this uh, perianal space, what happens is the locules are smaller in size, very small. The fat is tightly packed. So this small area between my fingers of both hands, the locule is small, fat is tightly packed and the walls are complete. So, this is the scenario in case of perianal space. Now, how will the infection differ in the two spaces? Suppose an abscess is formed in the ischioanal fossa and an abscess is formed in the perianal space. If the abscess is formed in the ischioanal fossa, the locules have got fat loosely packed. So, there is space for fluid to accumulate. The locules are not complete. So, when tension is exerted onto the locules, they will expand. So, less pain will be felt in case of abscesses in the ischioanal fossa vis-a-vis -vis the abscesses in the perianal space. Because the perianal space, the fat is tightly packed into small, small loculi bounded by complete septa. So there is difference in the kind of abscess formed in the ischioanal fossa and the perianal space. Perianal space abscesses are very painful. Ischioanal fossa spaces, they are relatively painless. So I read from the slide, fat in this space is tightly arranged. We are talking about perianal space. In small loculi formed by complete septa, so infections of this space are very painful due to tension caused by the swelling. Now we come to the ischioanal space. Once again, uh, ischioanal space infections are very painful. So perianal fascia fascia, we have seen that it separates the ischioanal fossa from the uh, perianal space and infections in the perianal space, they are very painful while infections in the ischioanal fossa are relatively painless. Now we come to the lunate fascia. Now what is the lunate fascia? Lunate fascia arches over the ischioanal fat. So you see uh, in the figure, the lunate fascia is marked by a capital G. So that is the lunate fascia, it begins laterally at the pudendal canal and merges medially with the fascia covering the deep part of external anal sphincter. So if you see on the lateral aspect, in the lateral aspect of the uh, ischioanal fossa is the pudendal canal. So from there, is this fascia, lunate fascia is going up and then it is passing up and merges medially with the fascia covering the deep part of the external anal sphincter. So this is marked by G in the figure. So this is called the lunate fascia and this G in the figure is separating the 4 from 1. 4 represents the suprategmental space while 1 represents the tegmental space or 1 represents the ischioanal fossa. So this lunate fascia is dividing the ischioanal fossa into a suprategmental space and a tegmental space. So this means that it is separating 4 from 1. This ischioanal fossa has got two components now which we can make out. One is lying below the lunate fascia and one is lying above the lunate fascia. The part lying below the lunate fascia is the tegmental part of the ischioanal fossa while the part lying above the lunate fascia is the suprategmental part of the ischioanal fossa. So far in my class I have refrained 
uh, from expressing 4 as a part of the Ischio angel fossa because I wanted to describe it here only that it is a small part the suprategmental part which is also a component of Ischio anal fossa lying in relation to the apex of the Ischio anal fossa. So, now we come to the neurovascular bundle lying in the ischio anal fossa that is called the pudendal canal. I mentioned it lies in the lateral wall of the ischio anal fossa. If you uh, comprehend that my two hands are representing the ischio anal fossa of both the sides with the anal canal in between, then in the lateral wall of the ischio anal fossa lies the pudendal canal. So, what is the pudendal canal? Pudendal canal is a facial canal in the lateral wall of ischio anal fossa enclosing the pudendal nerve and internal pudendal vessels. So, if you see the figure here, uh, one represents the ischial spine, two represents the lesser sciatic notch, then four will represent the pudendal canal. Now, this pudendal canal is lying in relation to the hip bone as seen in the figure and this is forming the, this is lying on the lateral aspect of the ischioanal fossa. Fascia of this canal is fused with the lower part of obturator fascia laterally, with lunate fascia above, with perianal fascia medially and with falciform process of sacrotuberous ligament below. So, 3 here in the diagram represents the ischial tuberosity, while 5 here in the diagram represents the perineal.